Tunisia and Al-Fur Al. Egypt now, where the killing of an Italian graduate student has the potential. <laughs> Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. An Italian is murdered in Egypt, and there's plenty of fallout, both diplomatic and in the news media. The botched child abduction case in Lebanon, and the team of Australian journalists that has some explaining to do. And in Malaysia, a corruption story that's exposed the Prime Minister, as well as the divide that exists between the mainstream and online media there. And good night and goodbye. After three years, Al Jazeera America signs off for the last time. On January 25th, the day that marked the fifth anniversary of the Egyptian uprising, a 28-year-old student went missing. His lifeless body was later found battered and tortured, dumped by the side of a road. The case has spiraled into a diplomatic incident because the victim, Giulio Regeni, wasn't Egyptian. He was an Italian, a PhD student living in Cairo, doing research into a movement that represents a challenge to the LCC government's hold on power, organized labor. The diplomatic sensitivities here are understandable. Egypt and Italy are co-dependents with a lucrative trading partnership as well as a shared history that dates back to the Roman era. But the Egyptian government's refusal to cooperate with Italian investigators, its unwillingness to hand over phone records and CCTV footage has led to the recalling of the Italian ambassador. And Italian news media, better known for competing with each other than collaborating, have coordinated a campaign that's taken aim at Egypt, particularly the country's human rights record under El Sisi. And some of the president's most vocal supporters in the Egyptian media have now started reprimanding the state for its handling of the Regeni case. One production note before we begin. Getting voices out of Egypt on these kinds of stories has become increasingly difficult, so we did both of our interviews from there on Skype. Our starting point this week is Cairo. When the Egyptian president summoned media figures and parliamentarians to his palace this past Wednesday, the Regeni case wasn't the only thing on his mind. But anyone watching his nationally televised speech, hearing him accusing evildoers of spreading lies, concluded he was referring to the murder case and what the media and Egyptians on social media are saying about it. What you saw definitely is uh, an increasing sense of frustration uh, that the media isn't all playing ball. Um, and indeed, when you look at the way that the media has covered the Regini case and also other issues over the past, uh, let's say, six to 12 months, they're not playing ball, but that's the nature of media. You know, they, they don't always do that. But for the most part, especially on matters relating to the security services, the Egyptian media have played ball with the El Sisi government. They certainly did back in February after Giulio Regeni's body was found and government officials offered some implausible explanations for what had happened to the student. As soon as fingers began pointing at the Egyptian state, and particularly the security services over Regini's death, Egypt went into its default muddy the water, you know, way of operating. First of all, it was perhaps a normal road accident that happens every day in Egypt. So then we have this uh, rumor that it was a gay lover spat. <laughs> Whether there were other forces at hand here, whether the Muslim Brotherhood were sort of trying to tarnish Egypt's image. And what they did was to spread these rumors through local media and through state media uh, of different scenarios that could have happened to Regini. Of course, the Egyptian newspapers tried to um, avoid to talk about the issue, about the Julia Regini affair, as they do with all the other cases of enforced disappearances in Egypt that are not at all covered by the Egyptian public uh, medias. We can add that there were camp full of newspapers that were part of the diversion uh, system uh, orchestrated by the regime 
So they were arguing that uh, Giulio Reggiani was killed for different reasons. In Italy, they were publishing uh, unverified news. Nobody could imagine that uh, an Italian citizen uh, uh, would be killed, especially because uh, everyone who knows something about Egypt uh, understood immediately that the torture body was a signature by the state. President el-Sisi implicitly acknowledged the gravity of the case and the importance of the bilateral relationship by granting one of Italy's biggest papers, La Repubblica, an exclusive interview. But the interviewer went easy on el-Sisi, and it took another media event two weeks later, a press conference held by the victim's mother to raise the kinds of issues that La Repubblica had clearly shied away from in its interview. Quello che è successo a Giulio non è un caso isolato, come è stato detto dal governo egiziano. The Italian public opinion uh, was divided after this interview because there was no fact checking how we can uh, let a president uh, with a dictator speaking without any kind of fact-checking. Everyone is aware now that Egypt is a dictatorship, that uh, torture is an endemic uh, method in Egyptian jails. Everyone knows it now. Everything changed when the Regeni family intervened, arguing that this was not an isolated case. Everything changed. And the Italian uh, mainstream newspapers and even the Italian public television began to be focused on the violations of human rights in Egypt. Five days after that news conference, Corriere della Sera, a national paper based in Milan, published a list of 735 Egyptians who have gone missing, presumed to be in jail or dead, over the past eight months. The paper was going after the LCC government in a way the Egyptian media never have. That same day, April 3rd, Egypt's Al Aram, a state-owned paper, changed its stance, publishing an editorial critical of the government's handling of the case. Then, some well-known voices on the Egyptian airwaves followed suit. It was as if the media there had been shamed by their Italian colleagues into doing their jobs. Ahram is uh, very closely aligned with the state. Uh, it's not a private establishment. And yet, uh, that editorial, which came from one of the most senior individuals within the Ahram establishment, uh, was highly critical of the state and how it was engaging with the Regina case. For that to be so uh, publicly out there, uh, I think is significant. Within the state itself, uh, there's uh, a certain degree of fragmentation. What we saw were the sort of populist, pro-media, pro-CC personalities on television go out on their shows and start to reflect some of this public anger. You had Amr Adib dedicate his show to what happened with Giulia Regini and really going on a rant. We are indeed the veneer, the sort of Teflon image of the president is slowly being broken down. That is being reflected by someone like Lamis al-Hadidi, someone who uh, was always regarded as a personal fan of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. That some in Egypt's media, even those who have almost always been in President El Sisi's corner, have regained their voices, at least over this story, will be welcome news for many Egyptians. But it took an Italian victim and the collective weight of the media in Italy to make that happen. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands more, like Giulio Regeni. They are Egyptians whose fates remain unknown and whose stories are going untold. On the download now, our viewers weigh in on the Giulio Regeni case and the way it's been covered. It's clear sometimes how much variety there is in the media. You know, it's not like there's only one narrative happening. You have lots of papers saying that Giulio is a spy, but there's also been a lot of papers doing like really good reporting. I think that sometimes the view of the Egyptian media can be entirely negative because it comes out with a lot of ridiculous stuff, but that there are good articles out there. There has been a lack of uh, critical, in-depth coverage 
uh, of the Italian government's response. This kind of criticism has been published uh, mainly in, in opposition papers such as uh, Il Fatto Quotidiano. Uh, I have the feeling that these criticisms have been largely absent from uh, the Italian mainstream media. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. A Syrian journalist has been killed in Turkey, part of a growing and deadly trend of cross-border murders, apparently at the hands of ISIL. Sahar al shirkat a fighter-turned-journalist, anchored an anti-ISIL TV program called Lines of Fire, among other shows, which aired on the Syrian online broadcaster Aleppo Today. He was based in the Turkish city of Gaziantep, which is near the border with Syria and less than 100 miles from Aleppo. In this CCTV footage, you can see al shirkat being shot outside his workplace by a masked man. ISIL's news agency, Amak News, claimed that the group was responsible for the murder and that it attacked the journalist over his work. al shirkat is the second journalist from Aleppo today to be murdered by ISIL in Turkey. Journalists working on perilous assignments often deal with the threat of being kidnapped. Seldom, however, are they the ones accused of doing the kidnapping. Channel 9 in Australia has a program called 60 Minutes that's been following the story of an Australian mother trying to regain custody of her two small children from their Lebanese father, who, she says, refused to return the children from Beirut after they visited him there last year. On April 7th, as the children were being dropped off at school, they were grabbed and bundled into a vehicle by men accompanied by a television crew. Eventually, those men, the mother, the crew, and 60 Minutes correspondent Tara Brown were all arrested and charged with kidnapping, which in Lebanon is punishable with a jail term of up to 20 years. Channel 9 has denied the charges that it was behind the operation. In an interview with The Guardian in the UK, the father of the children said he did not want his wife charged. And here's what he had to say about Channel 9. To hire mercenaries to come and kidnap your kids? How horrible are you guys? You're endangering everyone's lives, including my mother and the kids. For what? For a story? Some newspapers like to print scary headlines to grab the attention of their readers, and the Boston Globe is making no apologies for having done that last weekend on the subject of Donald Trump. The Sunday Globe produced a fake front page, which it published in one of its inside sections, imagining life in America under a Trump presidency. There were stories about looming deportations of immigrants, trade wars with China and Mexico, and new libel laws written to deal with the media. It included a note from the editor, Brian McGrory, saying, this is Donald Trump's America. What you read on this page is what might happen if the Republican front-runner can put his ideas into practice, his words into action. For his part, Trump called the Globe's fake front page stupid and worthless. How about that stupid Boston Globe? It's worthless, sold for a dollar. The diplomatic and political back and forth between Turkey and Germany over the satirizing of Turkey's president on German media outlets is rapidly descending into a farce. It all started a month ago, March 17th, with a program aired on the German channel NDR poking fun at President Tayyip Erdogan and his imperial tendencies. Ein Journalist, der was verfasst, dass Erdogan nicht passt, ist morgen schon im Knast. Germany's ambassador to Ankara was then summoned by the Turkish government, which wanted an explanation. That seemed to rile up another German program. And on March 31st, public broadcaster ZDF aired a poem written about Erdogan. ZDF provided Turkish subtitles, which we won't translate, given the grossly offensive nature of the content. This week, the Turkish authorities formally requested that Germany prosecute the satirist who read the poem, Jan Bommermann. Under German law, insulting a foreign leader can be illegal. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has reportedly authorized prosecutors to look into the case, but she insisted that that decision does not amount to a verdict. For much of the past year, Malaysia's media regulator, the Communication and Multimedia Commission, or MCMC, has been very busy. It's been trying to get a grip on the coverage of a corruption scandal, a story of billions of dollars that have gone missing from Malaysia's development fund and have allegedly landed in the bank accounts of the country's prime minister, Najib Razak. This story was broken online by a news site called the Sarawak Report and has since been chased by many other news outlets, most of them digital. 
The coverage has revealed something many Malaysians already knew, that the country's media landscape has got a split running through it, with mainstream news outlets either unwilling or unable to get their teeth into the story and online publishers leading the journalistic charge. And the Malaysian authorities have made this a difficult story to pursue. News sites have been blocked and pushed offline. Editors have been called in for talks with the regulator. And some foreign reporters have been detained, even deported, over the issue. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on a story that has an offshore angle to it and has the Malaysian government on tenterhooks, pushing back at online news sites unwilling to let it go. May 2015, the Sarawak Report, a new site that reports on Malaysia, broke a big story. It published what it called leaked documents, exposing a tale of corruption involving 1MDB, the state-backed development fund, and a trail of money leading to Prime Minister Najib Razak, who also serves as the Minister of Finance and his political allies. The Wall Street Journal followed up on Sarawak Report's story. It was the kind of journalism seldom seen in Malaysian papers or on TV, and it's no coincidence outsiders were doing the reporting. The Sarawak Report is based in London. Its editor is a Malaysia-born British journalist, Claire Rucastle brown and the Malaysian authorities don't like her or her work. That was made clear when, after the story got out, the country's media regulator, the MCMC, called a group of online news editors to a meeting in Kuala Lumpur. Essentially, the entire meeting was about Sarawak Report and all the news, and they were saying, you know, if you repeat what Sarawak Report puts out, you're also liable like them. Um, and of course, we asked the question, who says it's unverified? Who says it's false? This was a public interest story. We worked for a long time and we managed to get whistleblower information that could give us an insight into what had gone wrong. The MCMC, the Communications Ministry in Malaysia, has been relying on thug tactics, essentially, to shut up the media. What they attempted to do was to say that Sarawak Report was publishing false information. The guy who called for the meeting, he just kept repeating, if you report news which is not verified, and he didn't say who had to verify it, it's an offence. It was on the basis of that that Sarawak Report was banned. They banned us for allegedly passing out false and forged information. We have now been vindicated. All the information that we published has been shown by Malaysia's own Parliamentary Accounts Committee to have been correct. Nevertheless, Sarawak Report remains banned. It's been nine months since the website was kicked off the Malaysian internet. And at the same time, an official notice was issued by the MCMC. It warned Malaysians to, quote, stop spreading manipulated photos, unverified news, or any speculation on the investigations into 1MDB through social networks. If caught, offenders could face fines or even a possible jail term. Online media outlets like Malaysia Kini, Malaysian Insider, and Free Malaysia Today had been chasing the 1MDB story relentlessly, unlike some in the mainstream media. That split between online and mainstream outlets and the difference in their approach is evident when you speak with Malaysians. We spoke with three people. Zaini Hassan, editor of the Utusan Malaysia newspaper that is part owned by the ruling United Malays National Organization. Surinder Palkor, an academic at the University of Malaya. And Stephen Gunn, co-founder and editor of Malaysia Kini, a leading website publishing in English, Malay, Chinese and Tamil. In Malaysia, for, for a number of decades, the mainstream media is either directly or indirectly controlled by the government, and, and some of them are actually owned by the political parties, the ruling parties. It is a way for them to put all the mainstream media on a tight leash. Previously, when other scandals may well have occurred, um, the newspapers did, were not reporting them much. But now you've got this whole social media, this ecosystem that allows people to not only report it, but to discuss it, to dissect it, to debate it. And that's this entire platform where people can, you know, tear it to bits and come back to it and add on to it. You know, so it's become larger because of that. The problem with the social media, they are not professional. They can write whatever they like. They can give whatever opinions that they like, you know, without the, the fundamentals of the the facts, the facts. 
we have a history of no censorship. Uh, that's partly because of the fact that uh, when in the 1990s, when the former Prime Minister Mahathir came up with the idea that you know Malaysia could be the Asian uh, Silicon Valley, he has promised not to censor the internet. So we have that long tradition where there's no censorship of the internet. But of course, you know, they are, they are lately you see the government uh, trying to impose uh, you know, censorship on, on, on the internet media. On February 25th, a popular news website, the Malaysian Insider, was blocked by the government. The MCMC gave no specifics, but said the site had violated sections of the 1998 Communications and Multimedia Act. Just days before the block, the site quoted documents from the Anti-Corruption Commission that recommended charges be brought against the Prime Minister in the 1MDB case. Less than a month later, the Malaysian insider shut down. Domestic traffic to the website had all but disappeared, and so had advertisers. Jahabir Sadiq is the former editor of the Malaysian Insider. You see, when it happened, everybody was going around, how do you around a block by a Malaysian government? And the main impact was financial, of course, because our primary market is Malaysia. Advertisers dropped out. They deferred their advertising because they couldn't get the Malaysian audience, right? So it hurt us in, a, in financial terms, mainly. Now, what uh, has happened to Malaysia Insider is, uh, for me, I think it's a bit sad, like, you know. It seems that they are sensationalized. Most of the stories, you know, especially the issues that uh, pertaining to government leaders and so on. Uh, actually, you, you must have a, a kind of balance for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of the country. I think uh, we need to just ease a bit, you know, so that uh, we can have our more important agenda. Precisely whose agenda the media reflect is the debate right now. The Razak government has gone on the offensive over the story. On March 12th, the Prime Minister appeared in the city of Kuching when a reporter from the Australian broadcaster ABC threw a question his way. Uh, hello, Mr. Prime Minister, it's ABC Australia. I'm wondering if you can explain the hundreds of millions of dollars in your account. The reporter and his cameraman were immediately detained by Malaysian police and deported two days later. The government is pressing ahead with legislative changes as well. They will be tabled next month. The changes will create new powers to regulate online media including blocking those outlets that, quote, defame national leaders. On this story, though, the authorities might be a little late. I think for Malaysia and Malaysian media, what is significant is the genie is out of the bottle. You cannot uh, suppress reporters and editors who want to publish every aspect of news, no matter which side it comes from. It's a very, very interesting knife-edge time for Malaysia because this scandal has caused the entire country for the last year to consider fundamental issues like freedom of the press because they are confronted with possibly being transformed into a dictatorship in order to protect the Prime Minister. Hopefully this battle that is now going on will in fact result in a strengthening of Malaysia's democratic institutions because more people will understand what it is that underpins the rule of law. We are on a speeding bus with no brakes. And the obstacles in front of us, big ones, we swerve. You know, small ones, we ram through. But we have no clue what the government is going to throw at us next. You have a situation where there is really no option but for us to keep moving ahead. And finally, it was never going to be easy. The people working at Al Jazeera America knew that when the channel launched back in 2013, entering a crowded and competitive U.S. cable news market. AJAM, as it came to be known, tried to offer something different, but ended up falling short on viewers and advertising revenues. And in January, Al Jazeera announced its American channel's business model had proven to be unsustainable, that AJAM would close. Around 700 journalists, very good ones, would lose their jobs. So the digital team there built a website, bestofajam.com, to try to find new opportunities in American journalism. And we hope that they get them. This past Tuesday, the staff at the channel said its goodbyes. And that's what we're leaving you with this week. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. And so that is it for us here at Al Jazeera America. There are literally hundreds of people here in New York, as well as across the country and around the world, whose mission has been to give you the very best journalism. We are here in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. I am Fox News.
came out here to stand out for my rights. From our first moments on the air, when Rochelle and I welcomed you on August 20th of 2013, we've tried to bring you the stories that other news organizations don't, and we hope we have lived up to our promise. Just everybody being equal. To be the voice of the voiceless and to speak truth to power. This is just a watershed moment. To those of you who have supported us on air and online, we thank you for allowing us to tell your stories. I want people to know that I'm just like you. <laughs> good night and goodbye.